Welcome to the Frontline Club. Thanks for coming out in such uh, numbers to uh, listen to uh, Nick. Let me declare an interest. Nick and I are old friends, Balkan anoraks, I suppose we are. And um, Nick uh, sent me uh, a, a draft copy of his, or a proof copy of his book about three months ago, so I'm about halfway through it now. Uh, I confess it's not that readable. I, I, haven't, I haven't got to the, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendously good read. It's a, it's a, a great uh, evocation of the of the Balkans at a particular time in its history, and it's full of stuff that I knew Radovan Karadzic personally. So a lot of people in this room knew Radovan Karadzic personally. Some, there are a couple of people in this room who negotiated with him. I interviewed him several times, and um, but I didn't know half of what is in this book, um, and it's extremely revealing. And I wish I'd known it 15 years ago when I was interviewing it. What I propose to do is ask Nick a few questions to get the thing. Uh, kicked off and then open it up to you as quickly as uh, we can. The microphone will find you. Please, if you, if you feel like it, identify yourself, tell us who you are and ask your question and Nick will do his best to respond to uh, uh, what you ask. Nick, let me start with this Holbrook question. You were the first person to tell me, and that's some years ago, that the Karadzic family were saying that uh, Radovan was immune from prosecution because Richard, that was the, they were the terms of a deal that Richard Holbrook had made. It seemed at the time implausible, but what do you think? It's certainly, as, as I'm sure many people uh, know here, good evening by the way and uh, thank you for coming this evening and before we start I'd just like to say that um, I'm not an expert on the Balkans and I'm sure there's uh, many people in this room who know a lot more about what's been going on in Bosnia and the former Yugoslavia than I do. I was there from 2002 to 2008 for the BBC, first in Sarajevo and then in Belgrade and this book is basically my personal experiences and what I discovered in my sort of hunt for Radovan Karadzic. So it's not a definitive history of that time, it's not an academic history, it's more of my sort of personal journey through the, the wacky world, the wacky places, the wacky people uh, that you can come across in, in that part of the world. So it's, it's a very uh, specific type of book. One of the threads throughout that six years was this allegations of a, of a Holbrook deal. Uh, how could Karadzic remain uh, so free uh, for so long without there apparently being any evidence whatsoever where he was? That was a recurring theme that whoever I spoke to, um, the people who were hunting him, the diplomats, the spies, the generals, there was an absolute lack of knowledge for years. They knew nothing about where he was. And so naturally that promotes the conspiracy theories that are so familiar to that part of the world. And one of those theories was the Holbrook deal, that back in 95 or 96, depending on which conspiracy theory uh, you look at, that there was a deal done uh, between uh, Holbrook, the American envoy, and Karadzic himself. And needless to say, members of the Karadzic family told me, and also uh, supporters of Karadzic, that there was this deal. Jovan Zamatitsa um, was a very close ally of Karadzic during the war, disappeared in about 96, 97. I tracked him down. He was one of the, the great proponents of this alleged deal. And then, of course, if you spoke to the Americans or the British or anybody else, uh, this was absolutely ludicrous. This couldn't have happened. At one point, I, I doorstepped uh, Clinton at Srebrenica when they were opening the memorial cemetery there and I managed to get a couple of minutes with, with Clinton and asked him, you know, could there have been a deal? Did you do a deal? Did Holbrook do a deal? Certainly not was obviously the answer. I interviewed Holbrook on two or three occasions and on one occasion I was interviewing him with my, my radio microphone and I said, did you do a deal with Karadzic? And he said, can I say this on the BBC? That's C-R-A-P, crap. And that's, uh, as you've probably read, many quotes from, from Holbrook over, over the last couple of years. He utterly denies that. But it's a recurring theme, and now we see in The Hague, Peter Robinson and uh, the lawyers for Karadzic uh, claiming that there was this deal. Personally, um, uh, I think that if there had been a deal, a written deal, that that piece of paper would have emerged at some point. Um, it never has done. I think somebody somewhere would have released it, not least Karadzic himself, if he'd come to, to, to an agreement like that. He would obviously be in his interests. So I, I personally don't think that there was a written deal. Um, but that's not to say that perhaps there wasn't some sort of oral deal. Perhaps over a glass of whiskey with Holbrook late at night, uh, a nod and a wink, a pat on the back, and you know, you'll be all right from The Hague if you just perhaps withdraw. And that indeed is what the, the lawyer, Peter Robinson, for Karadzic is now claiming. I've been in touch with him in the last few days. Um, and this is what the, the defense is going to be, is that there was a, an oral deal rather than a written deal. Um, but of course, how on earth do you, do you prove an oral deal unless somebody had a, um, a very good microphone at the time? So I think 
think we don't know, but if there was anything, it was probably some sort of oral deal, some chat over a, over a couple of whiskies. But doesn't it say quite a lot about the way the Karadzic family see the world, that they thought that even if Holbrook did say something that could be interpreted as a deal, that they thought he was in a position to deliver on it? How did they think that a guy who was working for the State Department, not the UN, not the Security Council, not the Court at The Hague, how did they so misread the world that they thought he would be able to deliver on a deal of that sort? Well, to be honest, I think there's a lot of misreading of the world, perhaps, in, in various parts of, of the former Yugoslavia. We know, as I've already mentioned, as I'm sure many people here know, that the conspiracy theories that exist uh, in that part of the world. I mean, uh, at one point, uh, Liliana and Sonia Karadzic told me that the, the massacre at Srebrenica was actually organized um, with, by Clinton, that there was, there was reasons why Clinton wanted to see uh, seven or eight thousand Muslims uh, butchered in the July days of 1995. So um, perhaps the logic that we might work to uh, doesn't always apply to every individual mm. uh, from that part of the world. Yeah, I went to see Sonia Karadzic in December, and she told, and I interviewed her for the BBC, and she told me as well that the Srebrenica massacre had been organised by Clinton because he needed a certain number of dead Muslims to justify bombing the Serbs, and that it had been carried out by eight. Serbian criminals who were paid to do it and everybody knew the names of these eight Serbian criminals so again this is how the world looks and she's not lying in the conventional sense uh, this is how the world looks from Pali uh, and that's how it looked from Pali even at the time uh, of that the war was going on tell me Nick, before we throw it over how did why did you get there was a lot going on in Bosnia there was nation building Bosnia was trying to integrate itself into the new dispensation the entities were replacing anything resembling a central state. Why, why did you become obsessed by the hunt for Radovan? I, I, as I say, I, I arrived at the end of June 2002, um, and it was a whole new... I mean, I'd, I'd gone to mm -hmm. Bosnia briefly in 98. I hadn't covered any of the wars during the early 90s. Um, so it was, it was a first experience in 98, and I suppose I got hooked. The opportunity came in 2002 to be the, the BBC's correspondent there. Um, and I, in those first few weeks, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's an amazingly beautiful part of the world, very nice people, a lot of history. I'm a history graduate. I love everything to do with history. Um, but it soon became apparent uh, in those first few weeks uh, and months that there was this sort of huge cloud, black cloud, hanging over Bosnia and the former Yugoslavia. And uh, I arrived at the end of June, and it was the seventh anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre a couple of weeks later. And I hitched a ride uh, with the local Reuters correspondent my first visit to Srebrenica and we uh, there was the ceremony where the relatives of those who died came um, then I think they might have buried one or two uh, some of the bones that they'd found and that they uh, reinterred them um, and everybody was dispersing it was a very hot day perhaps 30 degrees 35 degrees there's no shelter in, in that valley uh, there's no trees everybody was was leaving and there was this this shouting and crying at the same time and I sort of put my microphone on as, as was my instinct and I moved to, to this sound and I saw a, a boy perhaps 13 or 14 years old uh, in Muslim dress um, I remember he had very rotten broken teeth and he was just in, in absolute pain he was crying his face was creased um, at that in those days I couldn't speak any any Serbian or Bosnian or Croatian um, the only two words that I understood that he was screaming were Radovan and Karadzic, Radovan and Karadzic, endlessly. And at one point he sort of collapsed into the, the tombstone. Um, and later on, I went back to Sarajevo, I went through my tapes, I got somebody to translate it, and he was basically blaming Karadzic for the, the death of God knows how many members of his family. And that really etched itself in, in my mind. And I started to ask the questions. Uh, that he was asking and many other people were asking as to why uh, this person who was to a certain extent <coughs> responsible for what happened in Bosnia was free. There was a, there's also another reason perhaps why I pursued the Karadzic issue. When all the, 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 the journalists have gone, the guns have fallen silent and the new conflict has begun somewhere else in the world, uh, Bosnia goes off the, the TV screens and uh, the journalists leave and nobody apparently is interested anymore. One of the one or two stories that could still attract the interest of editors in London, uh, there was Srebrenica, uh, there was Ratko Maladic and there was Radovan Karadzic. So it was easier for me to, uh, to pursue stories related to Karadzic because there was still an interest here in some quarters um, about what happened to Karadzic. 
So it was, it was perceiving that this was an unfinished business, it was perceiving that it was the way that I could do stories, and it was personal experiences like the one uh, that I just described at Srebrenica that, that started me asking the questions, well, where the hell is this guy? Do you think there was reluctance uh, in some quarters in the international community to hunt him down? Well, whenever you, you, you ask the, the politicians or the, the heads of police or, or the various peacekeepers there, no, absolutely, well, we are absolutely determined to, to find this individual. It's terrible what he's been accused of. Uh, we're doing all we can. And uh, as, as, as a couple of years went by, they were uh, the noose was tightening was one of the phrases. We're breathing down his neck, uh, all the great rhetoric. And so certainly the words were there, but whether the actions uh, were there, um, I very much doubt it. I was continually and utterly surprised by the lack, just the sheer lack of any information about where he was. There were sightings of Mladic at a football uh, stadium in Belgrade, sightings of Mladic in a restaurant uh, in Belgrade. Uh, other uh, alleged war criminals were being picked up. But for Karadic, there was nothing. And of course, that made me again more interested. But they became a sort of cipher for other things that were going on in the international force there. Whenever I used to go back to Sarajevo when he was still at large and asked this question, the British would say, it's the French, they always tip him off when we're coming to get him. You know, and it became a kind of way of, it was, became a way into the divisions, the way in which the international force there was divided. That was a problem, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that was uh, a lot of competition between the various organizations. Uh, I remember one British general described the S4, the peacekeepers, as there's no such thing as S4, it's just a cloak. And underneath that cloak, you have the American interests who will, they'll share a little bit with the British. Uh, the Germans sometimes brought in for some, you know, not very important information, the French, where well, we tend to exclude them. Um, so there's this conflict, and that was just one organization. Never mind, later on, we had the European Union police mission there. Uh, once UNMIB, the, the UN, had left, then we had U4, who were still there, the European Union force. There was so, and then the, obviously the national intelligence services, the domestic intelligence services. There was so much competition um, ongoing and jealousies between uh, not only nations, but also individuals. Uh, that this made it extremely difficult. And sort of at the top of the, the pyramid, you had Carlo Del Ponte, who would, who would fly in and uh, go with flashing, uh, flashing cars and uh, travel around the Balkans with, with lots of bodyguards and uh, have s apparently secret meetings in the, in the Holiday Inn, which was, was not very secret, not um, <laughs> in a corner, which was, uh, I think even, even I spotted that one. And, and uh, she did not get on with, with many of the international players there. Paddy Ashdown was, was, as we know, the high representative. So so there was lots of uh, petty attitude. jealousies. Yes. A lot of attitude coming yes. from The Hague at that time. Yeah. That's right. And, and so th this was not the environment for a coordinated approach to try and find this individual. Tell me about the sort of cult of carriage because, you know, I mean, for example, let me put it in this context. In about September, October 1993, 18 months into the war, I remember going to Foča, which was in Republika Srpska, it had been a 50 50 town. All the Muslims had gone, only Serbs there. And I remember meeting um, a couple who took me back to their house and told me the story about the weekend, the Serbs, the Muslims all left. And uh, after a while, they said, OK, we want to ask you some questions now. This is 18 months into the war. And the, the, the man turned to us and said, we've heard a rumor that Sarajevo's been attacked. Is it true? And I thought, gosh, this story's been on the front page of most of the newspapers around the world for 18 months. And, and you live in an hour and a half's drive away and you don't know. And we said, yeah, it's been under attack for 18 months now. And they said, who's attacking it? Is it the Mujahideen? We said, I thought, how can you not know? And it's interesting that this is a pre-internet age, pre-mobile phones, pre-texting, pre-Twitter, pre-everything. All they had was Serbian radio, not even television because there was no electricity. And so I understood something about how the cult of Karadzic and the cult of the Serb epic hero could take hold in an information environment of that sort. What puzzles me is why the cult of Karadzic still has such traction, such a hold on the imagination of people in the Serbian part of Bosnia now. I mean, have you got any... You spent six years living there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, um, whether there is a, a cult of Karadzic. Uh, again, I, I really first arrived in 98 and then 2002 when I started living there permanently. Um, in fact, sometimes I remember going to do Vox Pops in, in some places um, and expecting the Vox Pop from a hardline Serb area like Focha 
to say, I was trying to get that side, to get the Serb perspective and what people were thinking about Karadzic. And I expected them to say, you know, what a hero, it's terrible that uh, he's being pursued like this. And actually, quite often people would not say that. They would uh, start to say, "Well, he did. You know, he he was taking money himself during the war, and I'm not quite sure he is a hero for us." Um, I think that if there was, I wasn't there during the war. If there was a, a cult of Karadzic, then I think it disappeared pretty rapidly once the the post-war economic set in. And you know, uh, how are you going to eat tonight? And uh, uh, there was less interest, I think, in, in pursuing him. A lot of people perceived the fact that he'd perhaps run away with. 30 million euros or 30 million dollars um, uh, at the end of the war uh, and the question is what happened to that money so uh, th there, there, there was occasions where you could see it I was at De Brun for the the anniversary um, what anniversary was it it was the 1805 Serbian 1804 1805 Serbian rising and there was some so this was 2004 2005 and there was a huge two or three meter bronze statue of Cara Georgia being put up and that evening there was a lot of people celebrating uh, uh, hardline Serb nationalism and I remember recording a song where they made some lyrics of what a hero Karadzic is and uh, all the rest of it but that was pretty rare to be honest mm -hmm. and the, the person I think who, who seemed to be more popular uh, amongst the, the Serb rank and file was Ratko Mladic and is Ratko Mladic. I think Karadzic was gradually regarded more as being as lining his own pocket and not being such a hero but of course then you've also got the, the simple um, uh, at the end of the day Radovan is one of us he is a Serb and we know what the West and everybody else has done they all hate us we are victims so they're going to rally around to a certain extent but I don't think it was a very sort of proactive rallying it was more a responsive uh, type of uh, support for Karadzic. Let's talk about Mladic in a second I've got a couple more uh, uh, questions what I mean the you got to know the Karadzic family quite well what are they like? <laughs> I think some other people know them as well. Um, very nice, very pleasant family. Um, at one point, um, they made me uh, some chocolate cake, and uh, some, I had some nice nest cafe there as the, as the family came in, and the children, Radovan's grandchildren, played around. Um, Liliana Karadzic's wife is obviously bright, um, speaks reasonable English, or is a bit bit shy to uh, to speak English. Um, she follows a logic, she has her views. I asked her about why, why the war started, and it's all to do with in the 1980s how the population changed in, uh, in Sarajevo, and more Muslims came in from places like the Sanjak, and the good old days of Sarajevo had changed. Um, Sonia Karadzic uh, speaks a lot better English. She regarded the war as, as basically a continuation, or she, to be fair to her, she said that many Serbs believed it to be a, a continuation of the Second World War. Um, they were personable, they were friendly, they talked a lot. Uh, Sonia certainly talked a lot and really didn't want to interrupt her. Uh, luckily I had a few hours to, 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 to spare. So it was very interesting getting an insight into, into the mentality of, of the family. And what was bizarre, I, I think maybe one thing that I managed to achieve is not only was I, I had relatively easy access to the sort of the, the peacekeepers and the diplomats and the sort of the Western side, but also by getting into the family and getting to know them and listening to them, I could see it from, from their perspective. So you'd have the bizarre situation where one week S4 would carry out some massive operation on the famous pink house in Parley, would be helicopters and troops and the Germans would put their razor wire across and they'd charge into their house and they're really not roughed up but pushed to one side and they'd, they'd measure um, bits of the walls to see whether there's any secret compartments there and it's all a bit tense and all these sort of either British troops or American troops would be involved. Seven days later, I would knock on the door and they'd, oh, hi, Nick, hi, come in. And uh, they'd welcome me in t to a certain extent and I would sit there and I, I'd probably gain more information by, by, by doing that than the whole of the, uh, the, the, the peacekeepers who carrying out their raids. So I was able, to, I think, to, 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 to see things from, from both sides. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, she remembered me from the wartime and she knew that I was no fan of her father's and, and she didn't like me during the war. But she, you know, gave me an interview, and after the interview, she told me that in my stature as a journalist, I lived up to my surname, which is little, <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the more inventive insults I've had. Uh, one of the more imaginative. But there is a story about you in Belgrade. Three months before. I just, I just told you this a few before, yeah. before this. Tell the story. Oh dear. Right. Okay. Um, actually, it was a bit, bit more. About four months before Karadzic was arrested, I was. Uh, in a, in a, it was a rainy night in Tashmaden Park, and there's a restaurant there called Chancer. Um, 
and I was having dinner with uh, somebody in this room who stood at the back, uh, Milorad Batinic, and uh, another uh, Serbian chap who was uh, a freely admitted Chetnik during the, uh, during the war and uh, one of Sheshel's bodyguards. Um, and the reason we were there was because there was a Greek artist who I was doing some, some work with, uh, some filming. And uh, it was raining heavily outside, it was, uh, it, was, it was dark, there was I think two tables occupied in a relatively large restaurant. And at the table, uh, uh, not immediately next to me, but the one beyond, there was a, a couple there. Um, uh, and that's all I knew. Um, and then uh, when Karadzic got arrested, um, and the, the famous pictures of the beard and uh, the Santa Claus looks uh, emerged around the world, um, my companions uh, said that uh, they then obviously recognized that the person at the, the table, two tables away, uh, was Karadzic, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know whether uh, Milorad would, uh, would like to back that up, but you, you knew, you knew Karadzic as well during the war, and, and you, you recognized, uh, you realized then, and as did your friend, that... Uh, Just shortly, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to tell you, maybe the first one, I was with a friend, a friend. Thank you. Good evening to, to everybody. I was with a friend who noticed two policemen, secret police. And I said, no, this is so paranoia, what Nick taught me, <laughs> always paranoia. And we were laughing. Then I stood in front of the man with the, how you call it, curly hair, whatever, that funny thing. And I couldn't stare at him. And of course, I didn't realize it was Radovan. <laughs> now, my friend asked me, ah, did you call Nick, are we under surveillance because of these two bodyguards there? I said, come on, it's so paranoia, there is no surveillance, nobody knows my telephone number from Serbia, so no way. And then, in May, I think, he was arrested. Then we realized that was him, but Nick still doesn't believe me. <laughs> well, we are 100% really sure books, does that it? was him. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he didn't say in the book, but yes, that was him, no doubt about that. Actually, he was curious to come closer to us because we were coming from Bosnia, and he heard our accent. That was about, and that lady, Mila, she was standing there, but Nick, st st he's still not sure about that. <laughs> Nick is my friend and most suspicious man I ever met in this world. <laughs> Still as a compliment. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yes, so you missed, you missed a big story there. Well, to be, to be fair, to be, <laughs> all right, I mean, no, no, I mean, to just defend myself for a moment, um, I did go back to the restaurant and I did ask the staff there whether he'd actually been there because they'd become then aware of what he, what he looked like. And, they did tell me that uh, he, it wasn't him, that he hadn't been there. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, that, so he wasn't his, there, honestly. <laughs> I prefer his version of that story. <laughs> um, tell me this, what, uh, do you think it's important for that region that Karadzic should face justice at The Hague? And why? As I say, I first became interested because it was this big black cloud that was hanging over Bosnia and the region. Um, and I think it had to be it had to be dealt with at some point. Uh, there were just too many people from all nationalities who'd suffered during that war, and we all know that Karadzic was involved to a certain extent. And I think for that country to move on um, uh, and the people to move on, that it was right that Radovan Karadzic should uh, at some point face justice and put his case uh, before the international tribunal. Um, it, it just should happen. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask for questions from the floor. There's a microphone, yep. Fiona Lloyd-Davis there is going to ask a question first. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book. A uh, couple of questions I wanted to ask. One is, I made a film uh, for BBC in 2002 called Looking for Karadzic, and we got a list from, allegedly, from Bosnian intelligence of places that Karadzic had been to. And I just wondered if you knew you know, around 2002 or found out where he actually was, because we sort of travelled up and down Bosnia to Ostrog and in Montenegro and wherever, and whether you actually found out where he was at that time. Thank you. Um, basically, from, from my understanding, and I, I've spoken to, to people, um, basically when, when he got arrested, I went back to Belgrade and I started to make contact with, with previous contacts and to, to try and piece it all together because I wanted to know where he'd been, who'd been protecting him. And I'm pretty convinced 95-96% um, of the, the strength of, of what I was told, um, which is basically that in the winter of 97-98 he went straight to Belgrade and he stayed there all the time. Um, 
he did uh, the, the rumors that he went to to Austria or watching football games in Venice or Croatia is almost certainly rubbish um, he lived in Belgrade for the first few years in Belgrade he basically stayed in his flat as one person told me he was scared of his own shadow he grew the beard very early very early I don't know exactly when but he's had it for several years um, in uh, a couple of years before he was arrested, this Dragan Davic persona was created by himself with the help of others. Um, and then he bizarrely went, as we know, all know, into the public arena and gave seminars and set up his website and all the rest of it. Um, but he was basically in Belgrade all the time. I, he, may have, he may have made the odd trip um, to Bosnia or Montenegro. Liliana Karadzic told me in 2004 that she'd seen him briefly four years previously. Now, Liliana Karadzic was meant to be under constant surveillance, although I'm not convinced, convinced of that. Um, so it's possible that maybe he made a quick trip to Bosnia or they met but somewhere, but he was basically all, in Belgrade. All those high-profile S4 raids, you know, on hilltop town villages in Bosnia were for show? Or? I think occasionally they were for show. I think occasionally uh, they genuinely believed that he was there. Uh, I was also told that there was a lot of disinformation, clever disinformation put out. There was one rumor that uh, uh, that he that they said that he was in that some, they received some intelligence that he was in a certain place. So the raid was carried out, and at exactly the same time, Karadzic was somewhere else making one of his few forays, maybe between Bosnia and Serbia. So I, th I think many people, like General David Leaker, the British general who was head of UFO, I, I believe that he genuinely did want to get Karadzic. I think Paddy Ashton did genuinely want to get him, and they they put a lot into it. A lot of resources were put in in there. Um, uh, but they never got anywhere near. The, the other question is there's an American ap academic who's published a paper saying he's interviewed two State Department officials who can confirm the Holbrook deal. Have you talked to him or to the State Department I've officials? not, no, but uh, having just received an email in the last 24 hours from Karadzic's lawyers saying that it was an oral deal, um, I think it starts to crumble quite rapidly, the idea, if, if, even if his lawyer's saying that. I mean, um, maybe it was an oral deal, but I think the piece of paper is, is very unlikely. I, I met um, Vladimir Nadezhdin, who was in the... Uh, uh, in the Milosevic uh, cabinet in 95-96 and I met him in a Belgrade cafe um, about a year ago and he actually said he saw the document and he, he actually I said can you draw it in my notebook and he drew drew what it said and the terms of it he showed me where the stamp was and the signature and everything and okay quite convincing quite nice good radio even good pictures um, but where, okay where is it then where is that piece of paper where's the real piece of paper is it in the State Department does Radovan have it have you got it but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, but the other context of this whole thing is that by June of 1996, when this deal is alleged to have been struck, it had become a matter of urgency for Karadzic to, to disappear because he was already indicted, I think, is my yeah, Carl right. He was already yeah. indicted. Yeah. The country was filling up with NATO troops. He had, to, he had to disappear from public view, deal or no deal. Um, so it seems... The, the main reason he disappeared from public view was not that it was part of it was his side of the bargain, but bec but because if he hadn't, he'd have been arrested by somebody and whisked off to the Hague, pretty much. Well, come quite possibly. I mean, in in the book there is um, it's actually I've, I've borrowed it from my Financial Times correspondent Neil Macdonald, who did an interview with Holbrook just a few months ago in Belgrade. Um, it's actually an unpublished interview where Holbrook actually describes the whole. Um, uh, events during '96 and how Holbrook was sent back uh, to, to, to the former Yugoslavia to try and get rid of Karadzic, to try and force him to withdraw. Um, and uh, he, you know, he, he claims that uh, he obviously virulently denies the fact that any deal was done for that. Uh, his family say, "Well, why on earth would would he withdraw from all these posts as well?" Um, and Holbrook says, "Well, he doesn't know what Stanisic said to him because Stanisic went over in the helicopter and and got the deal and so." On, but Holbrook is, is, is certain that he determined that he didn't actually offer a deal and I said there's no piece of paper. Tell us about the arrest last July. What, how did they get him in the end? He was, um, he was due to go and see friends. Um, he was late uh, in his apartment on Yuri Gagarin Street in New Belgrade. Um, so he wasn't going to go the normal way that he was going to go, so he got on a bus, bus at 7.15 in the evening, maybe slightly after that. Uh, he was reading a religious book, it was not a Bible, he had a hat on, he was on the fourth seat back from the front of the 73 bus. 
which was going to take him through New Belgrave and to, uh, to where he was going. As the journey progressed, police got on at different bus stops. Some were in plain clothes, some were in uniform. And then at a certain point, I don't know, after about 20 minutes, half an hour of the, the bus journey, uh, one of the policemen leaned over to the bus driver and told the bus to, to pull over to one side. The police moved to where Carradish was, was, was sitting. They roughly apparently pushed away um, an old lady who was one of the people I spoke to. Um, and uh, roughly apparently lifted him to his feet, took him off the bus, put him in a car and they drove back to the beer headquarters, the intelligence service, and this was the Friday. It uh, was not the Monday, as when it was officially announced Monday evening, he was, as he claimed in court, it was the Friday evening that he was, uh, that he was picked up. How did they find out, when did they find out that this Dragan Davic was in fact Radovan Karadzic? Vladimir, Vladimir Vukcevic, who is the, the war crimes, chief war crimes prosecutor in Belgrade, told me that they knew um, on June the 16th, they were 100% certain, so this is one month uh, before his arrest. On June the 16th, they were 100% certain that he, of who the real Dragon Dabich was, and he was put under 24-hour surveillance from that moment. Why was he arrested at the point he was? Well, my feeling is that it was to do with the fact that uh, Vojislav Kostunica and Rade Bulatovic, the Prime Minister and the Intelligence Chief, walked out of office on the Tuesday and Wednesday of the week that Karadzic was arrested. On the Thursday, uh, Sasha Vukidinovich, uh, the, the new intelligence chief, came into, came into office and 24 hours later Karadzic was arrested. As we know, Serbian, the Serbian political system is deeply divided, was deeply divided, and I think this was the pivotal moment. It's interesting with the fact that he had been under surveillance for a month already. There are a couple of different theories as to why he was picked up then and why not before. One of Karadzic's lawyers told me that maybe somebody high up within the Serbian uh, establishment actually made the, the, the necessary phone call and took the $5 million reward, which is on offer, just before leaving office. That's one rumour. The other, the other information I was told by somebody linked to Serbian intelligence was that um, an audit was done of the various people under surveillance during that time. And when it was discovered that one of the people who was being watched was actually Radovan Karadzic, that was it. That's what uh, prompted the arrest. So I, I, I don't know the definitive answer, but the, the key element was the fact that, of the change, that the reformers came into power, the old guard went. So are you saying that Krishtunitsa and Bulatovic knew about it and were protecting him? Did I say that? Well, you said that, it, it, that, 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 that while they were still in power, that, that they, he had been under 24-hour surveillance and not picked up. Is that because Krishtunitsa and Bulatovic had not given their authority, or did they perhaps not know? Had they, I mean, do you know the answer? I mean, I mean, people have told me that uh, that, that individuals like Bulatovic and Kostunica knew uh, either where he was or how to get to him. Yeah. Okay, that's quite. Any any other questions from the floor? Yes. Okay, well, can we have the microphone here? <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Charles Crawford, British ambassador in Bosnia from 96 to 98 and then Belgrade from 2001 to 2003. So I was following this case a lot and my first job was in Yugoslavia in 1981 to 84. So I, I came along to, uh, to hear the story. I mean, I think some of the things you've said are wrong, actually. I think we were, we were close at different points. I think it's worth bearing in mind the... I mean, I don't want to talk too long, but cause it's your show, not mine. But the... I mean, there are certain phases in all this. There was the phase in which he was a bad man and secretly indicted. There was the phase in which he was then publicly indicted. There was the phase, these phases overlapped. There was the phase when the war ended. I mean, uh, Karadzic wasn't allowed to go to Dayton, but of course he was sort of lurking there in the background politically. And I've written about some of this on my website, so anyone who wants, including the deal point, by the way, if you're interested in my view of the deal, it's on the website. Once th the problem came up in 96 was how do we get his posters down in Republika Srpska for the first elections following the Dayton deal. And I was at a meeting in London, I've talked about it on the website, um, and how do we force him off the playing field was the point. And there wasn't the stomach to arrest him. If you read Holbrook's book, he says, President Clinton didn't want to risk American lives going in to arrest him before the election, because don't forget, you know, they were coming up to an election. So there was that phase, and then he sort of, 
he was around when I was in Bosnia. The idea that, I think you're wrong, actually, I think the idea that he had to disappear because he was about to be arrested simply wasn't true. Mm, okay. he, he was up there, and people sort of knew where he was, but there wasn't the political... Uh, there weren't the um, orders to the soldiers to go mm -hmm. and arrest him. The order was... But there would have been eventually, wouldn't there? Well, eventually, would have come but a eventually point. was a long time. Then we yeah. had the decision, do we go after the war criminals at all? So the first decision was to go after Mr. Durljaca up in uh, northern, near Banja Luka somewhere. He was then killed in the attack. The big policy decision was, do you go after the, the sort of high fruit or the low fruit? And, and was there a mistake made? Sorry? Should it have been the high fruit? I would have said so, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I recommended the high fruit. Uh, someone on the ground because I thought you know they were there to be plucked as it were mm -hmm. but we decided partly because don't forget by then the major government was mm. you know ending down all these things make a big difference mm. I mean, you've got to remember the wider context to the sort of you know you're sending soldiers in to do something dangerous one of the SAS people was injured in the attack on Deliaccio it's not totally straightforward all this anyway so then there was that phase and and then you then move on to the point where we really are starting to go after him once Clinton goes. If there was a sort of understanding, or deal, call it what you like, you then move into a different phase. And I, I mean, it's, it's on the public domain. I recommended to Robin Cook that I go and see Karadzic to ask him to surrender. And this was then run past the Americans, and they vetoed it. This was in 97. And I now wonder whether or not part of the thinking was, was there some sort of understanding? They didn't want this to come out. So we still knew where Karadzic was as, as late as 97? No, we didn't know where he was, but I was confident I could go and see him. Right, OK. I knew, because he was around. I mean, he wasn't hiding in that yeah. way. Anyway, then we move on to a different phase. And don't forget, while this is going on, you've still got Milosevic there. So if he does run off to Belgrade, you've got a hostile force with Kosovo bubbling up. He's about to be indicted. Mm. So in a sense, the, the more these people are under pressure, the more they huddle together for comfort. Yeah. So Milosevic finally falls, and then we get Kostunica and, and Jinjic coming in, and that's when I was ambassador in Belgrade. We reopened the embassy. You had a, an intelligence relationship with the Serbs, and the question was, could you trust them to deliver? And I think I don't quite personally believe that Kostunica knew where he was, but this decision would not be taken without the senior man in the country putting his sort of signature to it effectively. And I don't think Kostunica was ready to do that. And it's no coincidence that as soon as Kostunica and Bulatovic have gone, bingo. Because mm. the new man, Tadic, is prepared to effectively say, let's just get this damn thing over and done with, and he's gone. And we, you know, we, we did try very hard. A lot of resources went into this. But, but how much did you know? How much did you really know? How close were you? Well, you don't know how close you are, of course. I mean, and, 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 um, and I, had, I have reason to think and I, funnily enough, I met someone this afternoon who was dealing with it, that we were quite close. But, but you're in a context in which you have to rely upon the Serbs as your friends. Having had Milosevic then as your enemy, you're then dealing with the Serbian government. You say, yes, 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 we're doing all this stuff. But are they making sure, spreading disinformation, all this sort of games, to make sure at the highest level that it doesn't happen? You, know, you can be damn close, but if they're going to make sure it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter how close you are. You know, it's that last point that all of a sudden someone is prepared to risk his life, frankly. I was there when Jinjic was assassinated. Mm. If Jinjic hadn't been assassinated, mm -hmm. this would have happened a lot earlier. But these war criminals linked to the drug dealers, linked to all these other weird overlapping groups of gangsters, killed the best man in the Balkans in the last sort of, you know, 100 years. Yeah. And that set the whole thing back. It was a big signal. Yeah. Don't mess with us, you know, because this could happen. And then once, you know, it's Tadic and the people who made this decision had to be brave. And I think they made that decision. Um, you know, Mladic, it's a harder case again. I mean, on the, they've written about this in the Serbian papers. On the night Milosevic was sent to The Hague, there was a sort of request came to us, will you go in and arrest Mladic tonight? You know, now, you know, you just can't work that way. You can't sort of get on the phone to the SAS and say, just come down to the middle of Serbia and arrest someone. It doesn't work that way. So, you know, hang on, well, n uh, no. You know, let's just talk about this a bit. And then that window of opportunity, if it really was a window of real opportunity, you know, closed and then he's still running around somewhere. So, um, you know, it, it's a long story. Yeah, but I think no, this the, is great. This is really good. I mean, I, I, mean I, you know, I, I, you know, I respect the, obviously, the effort you've made personally to track it down. I just think, and I appreciate really the fact you say we really were trying, because we really, really were trying. Uh, but it doesn't follow that, you know, don't forget, as in Bosnia, you know, the, the S4 numbers have really declined over the years. You know what it's like, you go into one of these villages, you're pretty damn conspicuous. So you have to do it in partnership with people. And but, those people... And do you think you were being led up the garden path sometimes? Oh, yeah, of course. That he was nowhere near where the... Yeah, where of course, you, because mm. there was a campaign to make sure, you know, from his relatives and everyone else, and after a while it becomes a sort of stupid game. 
And my big point was to the, to the EU, look, folks, we're the EU running around the Balkans, spreading like a sort of, you know, a sort of farmer in the Bible, throwing seeds of reasonableness out of a bag in all directions. And behind us are these war criminal guys wandering along, sort of laughing. And the Balkan folk are looking at us saying, do these idiots not know there's someone behind them? Or are they too weak? Or are they pretending? Mm. I mean, what's the psychology of this? And you can understand where these conspiracy theories come from. And you don't need to, I didn't, if I can say so, I didn't like the idea that down in that part of the world you have conspiracy theories. You get them everywhere. You know, look at 9-11. You know, it's not that people down there are sort of genetically predisposed to being weird. It's just that the, the, there were a lot of real inconsistencies in the policy. But can, can what, I just while you've still got the microphone, just, I'll, I'll, Nick, Nick will come back. While you've still got the microphone, briefly, what is your view of the so-called Holbrook deal? <laughs> Well, my view of the deal is, my, my instinct is that, is that we wanted him to get away out of the picture. Um, I mean, to sort of leave, so that the sense of the... Because his party, I mean, they won the election. Krasnik won the election mm. in 1996, uh, in mm. September. So the question was, can you keep the party, who are clearly going to win the election, without having the sort of Karadzic um, iconography? And so did the Americans go along to the cell and say, look, he's got to go? Of uh, one reason or the other, he's got to go. And, you know, did they say, we will hold back on chasing him? Maybe they did. I mean, I mm. really don't know that. But the point is, it, I mean, I go back to your point. I don't think, I don't see how they could have thought that could have been binding. Mm. This is really the point. Yeah. Um, and if it comes out now, there was some sort of understanding. Holbrook will just say, look, real politique, I guess. Yeah. You know, on we go. Yeah. He was a jerk. He got what he deserved. But they're I mean, claiming that he promised them immunity from, from prosecution. Well, even if he did. I mean, I don't see how they thought could have thought that was binding. Yeah. But, but, you know, at that time, obviously, you know, it's a bit hard to imagine what life would be like 10 years after that. Yeah. Maybe at that time, you know, that's what they thought. And a lot of politics was involved with the Hague indictments. Mm -hmm. but President Tuchman, for example. Yeah. I just wanted to, to you were, had access to a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. Can you tell me now, honestly, that between 98 and the, his arrest, that there was ever any 100% proof as to a location in terms of wire intercepts, photographs, video, eye on eye surveillance confirmed? Any moment in those years where Karadzic was definitely spotted in one single place? I mean, the answer is I just don't know the answer to that question. My guess is not, but that's a guess. And I think that's disgraceful. <laughs> after, after, after so many years, with all the apparent resources that, that the West or NATO, whatever has, they couldn't actually have any definitive location on Karadzic is remarkable. It's remarkable, it's not necessarily disgraceful. It's good. Paul Cleary, Mammoth Mammoth, following on from this. Can you put the mic on? Yeah. Clearly, Mammoth Mammoth, following on from the labyrinth eye and all conspiracy, in your view, how much was the detection of Vladic to do with, uh, with Serbia's negotiations to get into the European Union? To do with Karadzic's finding? I mean... Just as it was with all the other guys who got now, it had to be a convenient time. It had to be a convenient time for their negotiations of loans and other pieces. I mean, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is this huge division within Serbia between the reformers who want to see Serbia move close to the European Union, perhaps even NATO, and the people like Nikolic, who perhaps in the past referred to, to Serbia should be uh, the next state or province of, uh, of Russia. Um, so I think that there is no doubt that, and I interviewed Tadic on a couple of occasions, that there was the genuine belief and desire to draw a line under the past, and that would help propel Serbia a lot faster and a lot quicker to joining the European Union. And I think that the war criminal issue was just one of the factors. They knew it had to be dealt with. Uh, they believed it needed to be dealt with. You know, Tadic was one of the few Serbian leaders who actually turned up at Srebrenica to, to pay his respects to, 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 to the people who died there. So certainly the great, the great political philosophy is let's get Serbia into the European Union. This is one of the issues that has to be dealt with. Uh, it may be unpleasant, it may be difficult. And I think one of the, the considerations perhaps throughout these years um, is the, the continual political calculation within the Serbian hierarchy. Can they get away with it? Um, Serbia, as we know, can be a very unstable place following the assassination nation of Jinjic and I was, was there in Belgrade. Serbia was wobbling. Um, it, it was pretty scary as to what was going to happen next. There was a state of emergency, there was uh, camouflage police on the, on the streets, uh, road checks everywhere. Um, uh, you know, how people were going to react, who was going to take over was, was, was serious questions. And
And so I think there's that continual calculation. We want to perhaps move forward, we do want to reform, but if we start arresting these guys, Mladic, Karic and so on, is that going to destabilise the country and make things even worse? I think that was probably quite a difficult decision to make at times in the last few years. So the European Union, is, is, yes, is central, but uh, the war criminal issue is only part of the European Union track, in my, my view. Is the argument over the European Union settled in Serbia now? Is there a settled will among the Serbian people that that's the direction they want to go in? I, th I think from, from all the sort of the, the, the polls and the people that I've, I've spoken to in, in Serbia, uh, most people do want to be in the European Union, but there is certainly a substantial number of people who would not want to uh, sell Serbia down the road, as they say, just so that we can be in the European Union. Yes, question there. Yeah, just um, following, following on from the previous questioner, just I was wondering, it's been almost a year since Karadic was caught. Uh, what's the feeling in Serbia with regard to Mladic? Um, especially with regard to they want to join the <coughs> EU. Um, are they willing to catch him? I assuming know. they know where he is, I, I can get, I'm assuming. Have you uh, ever been in a restaurant where he's been at the next time? <laughs> yes, yeah. Actually, we, sh we shared a beer once, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't recognise him. Um, <laughs> Uh, for, for me, I think Mladic is, is more of a hero to, to, to many Serbs than, than Karadic. He's seen as the, the great war hero with his, uh, all his first class honours in all the military academies he went to and, and, and what, what, what a hero. Uh, so he's, he, I think he's more respected and more honoured and uh, more of the, the sort of part of the, the Serbian uh, nationalist psyche. Um, but, but, but very different. I mean, it, it's rumoured, it's, it's believed that, that Mladic is somewhere in Serbia. That's, you know, everybody believes that. Everybody seems to think that he is somewhere. He's probably in the next tower block to where, to where Karadic was. The issue about Mladic is, the feeling is that he would not go without a fight. And at the end of the day, Karadic was, was picked up on a bus and that, and that was it, carrying his book and, and wearing a hat. Mladic is believed to be more likely to be prote protected. Um, he may have bodyguards who are prepared to fight. He may be prepared to die himself. Um, uh, there's rumours that he might be very ill. Um, so, so I think there is more inclination of Serbian people not to want to see Mladic arrested than to see Karadic. It's more likely to be bloodier um, in any arrest operation, and quite possibly Mladic would, would end up dead, either killing himself or being killed uh, during the process. But I, I, I genuinely believe that, that people like Tadic do want to see that resolved and, and would like to see Mladic whisked off to uh, to The Hague. Um, I, I believe that. Whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. They keep The rhetoric keeps coming, you know, the noose is tightening, we're breathing down the, the shoulder, all those familiar terms from Bosnia. But we'll wait to see whether it happens. There's just himself and Goran Hadjic now on the, on the wanted list. Um, surely the thing that the, the arrest of Karadic demonstrated to us was that all those rumours and theories and speculations over a decade turned out to be pretty much baloney. He was... He was hiding in Belgrade all along, as you yeah. now believe, from yeah. 1997 onwards. Yeah, 1997, yeah. So it does, it does mean that everything we speculate about Mladic is likely to be no more than speculation as well, isn't it? Yeah. I think, I think people believe that he's, he's, in, he's in Belgrade or, or near Belgrade, yeah. Yes, question at the back. <coughs> yeah, hi, Nick. Uh, I'm Steve Whitehouse. I was <coughs> with the UN in Bosnia in 2002 onwards. I'd be interested uh, to hear... <coughs> your views on the following proposition. There's a school of thought uh, in the Balkans which would say that to a, a certain extent, to quite a large extent, the Bosnian Serbs, and you could therefore say Karadic, have achieved what they were uh, trying to get, which was uh, a high degree of autonomy for the Bosnian Serbs, an ethnically cleared uh, Bosnian Serb entity, which uh, spends most of its time doing its level best to have nothing whatsoever to do with the rest of the country and even even to this day flirts with the idea of perhaps forming some sort of partnership with Serbia politically or otherwise. Um, do you see that in that sense Karadic can be seen as a partial success from his point of view? Um, he'd probably see himself as a, as a partial success at the very least. Um, yeah, I think one of the yeah, I think on the surface um, the Republic of Serbska was was established. Um, it did have a, a large degree of autonomy, but one of the processes that that I've seen over the, the last few years in Bosnia, uh, which which got more energy under Ashdown's leadership, was this this attempt to reduce the powers of both both entities of the Federation and Republic of Serbska. I remember uh, I remember going to a, a Bosnian Serb 
army base just outside Srebrenica about three years ago, and uh, I was a bit worried about you know how I was going to be received and what the reaction would be. And I was given a guided tour, and the local colonel said yes. And of course, ultimately, we do want to join NATO. Um, we do believe in partnership for peace. All these sort of reformist elements coming from the most conservative element of, of Republika Srpska. And shortly after that, or is around about the same time, they signed up to an agreement to actually have, at least on paper, um, a single military um, in in Bosnia. Um, so. Uh, and the various other issues. I think that the only main autonomous area left now is, is police. All the other areas have basically been put under under the state state control, and it's been a struggle and it's been difficult. And certainly, Republika Srpska uh, still exists, but all the checkpoints have gone. Even many of the signs have gone that they, they used to be. You're now welcome to to, to Republika Srpska. Some of those are now have disappeared. So, I think Bosnia is becoming more of a state. Um, many many Serbs will not want to in, in Republika Srpska want to see that. But that seems to be the inevitable way uh, that Bosnia is going. So maybe he achieved something from, from his own perspective during that time. But whether it will last forever, I'm not sure. Do you think it's gone all that progress that you, you attribute to Paddy Ashton? I agree with you. I think Paddy Ashton did a, 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 you know, achieved some extraordinary things, or some extraordinary things were achieved uh, while Paddy Ashton was in charge. But do you think it's gone backwards since he left? Well, certainly Mr. Mr. Dodik is um, causing a lot of headaches and problems for. Uh, for the international community. Um, I basically, although my, my home is in Sarajevo, I spent the last, the last year in Kosovo and the, the two years before that in Belgrade. So um, I wouldn't say that I have an intimate knowledge at the moment of the, 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 the politics there. Um, as, as I understand it, things are pretty stymied, that, that perhaps there's not as much progress going on as, as there should be. Joe Biden was pretty pessimistic and candid when he spoke there a week ago, wasn't he? What do you think then? I don't know. You, you, okay. I'm asking you. Ask you, me about Kosovo. Okay, we'll come to that. Alistair Burnett's got a question. Hi. I wanted to come back. Alan was asking about the importance of the trial and justice. Uh, given the perception of many Serbs, even Serbs who are pro EU, that this Hague is basically biased against them, whatever, however fair a trial, and there's a question over that he gets, I mean, what impact do you think it's going to have? in the Republic of Serbia and Serbia. Uh, you're absolutely right, yes. I mean, the, the vast majority of Serbs regard the, the Hague as an, as an anti serb tribunal, as uh, victor's justice. Um, and whatever happens, um, presumably Karic will be sentenced to a, a good few years. I imagine he probably thinks that himself. Um, many people will just simply not recognize that uh, in the former, U former Yugoslavia. <coughs> Having said that, I think as time goes on and, and more evidence perhaps comes out and, and people's lives move on and people start to focus on other issues perhaps rather than nationalism and borders um, o over a period of time. I think there are more people who are prepared to listen um, to, to, and, and watch the evidence and see the evidence for, the, for themselves. There was a sort of analogy that I used to play in my own mind when I used to drive from Sarajevo to, to, to Belgrade. In, the, in those first days when I entered Serbia, um, I used to think that anybody I spoke to would just deny absolutely everything. Um, that, that, that the, the mentality was, listen, um, all, all these allegations about crimes that Serbs committed was, in, it was just rubbish, you know. This is what the Serbs are doing. That was the right thing. This is our attitude. And as time progressed, I sort of visualized Serbdom, Serb people as sort of going halfway. It's sort of somebody patted them on the shoulder and actually perhaps there is something behind there. So instead of just looking that way, tunneled forward, Believing in everything that they ever believed in the propaganda that was that was that was put out during the 90s I think many people started to think well hold on perhaps there is something behind me and people did start to turn around as more evidence came on people's lives moved on but in terms of the Hague Absolutely, and, and when uh, somebody like Nasser Oric is, 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 in a sense, freed, then that's 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 great. Sort of, uh, again, more propaganda from from the Serb anti Hague perspective. Uh, so I think you always find it difficult to convince Serbs that a real justice was done. But I think over time, as with many things, I think perhaps there is a growing aware awareness of some of the crimes that were committed um, in, in in the Serbian name. Is it true to say, is it fair to say? Do you think that that a sign of progress in Serbia itself has been the um, the, the war crimes prosecutions that have taken place in the Serbian judiciary, with Serbs prosecuting Serbs, uh, Serbs holding up, in, in a sense, that becomes a much more effective and rewarding, productive mirror yeah. for the Serbs to hold up to themselves yeah. because that, that justice in 
public opinion has more credibility, absolutely, more legitimacy. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's absolutely right. And Vladimir Vucevic, the, the chief war crimes prosecutor there, who's had many death threats himself, I think he has um, helped lead, lead the way, lead, lead the idea of reform. Um, and trying to, to, to allow the Serbian people to realise that, that crimes were committed and, and, and uh, cases have been prosecuted. And one shouldn't underestimate the impact of the, the famous Scorpion video when um, that was released, when we saw um, five or six um, Muslims taken from, from Srebrenica and, and shot in the back. And that uh, was, I think, headline news here and headline news around Europe and the world. That had a massive psychological impact, even though everybody sort of knew that thousands of people did die at Srebrenica, to actually see the hard evidence of people being shot in the back and dragged into a building, uh, that did have a psychological impact on people. And also, it's a, it's a drip by drip process. Dragan Cavic, who was the president of Republika Srpska, uh, went on, on national or Republic of Serbia or whatever TV in was it 2005 2006 after the the international report into how many people well actually it was a it was a Bosnian Serb report but uh, the arms were twisted by the international community on the Bosnian Serbs to write the report uh, which admitted how many people had died he went on television and said that what happened at Srebrenica was one of the darkest pages in Serbian history mm. and that was four or five years ago so uh, events like this I think start to uh, to change views and change attitudes um, and the work of people like Vladimir Vukcevic and the various trials that have taken place over the last couple of years helps in that process, I think. Alison, anything else? Well, I've just come back to the point the point Basta was making about how believable it is that they made a decision that they wanted to go because, I mean, we know in Kosovo that in the run-up to independence that the UNMIC leadership knew that there were certain higher politicians in the Albanian community who were corrupt and they were prepared there were police operations prepared against people which were stopped at the last minute. The argument being stability, stability, stability. We don't want to upset the apple cart. So. Is yeah, that true? It's entirely plausible. I, I don't know about that specific case, but, but certainly I think that, uh, as most people would, would realise and think here, that stability is the prize in, in places like the Balkans, and uh, maybe a lot of sacrifices are made in order to maintain stability, and maybe a lot of justice is uh, absent because of that. We've got a question up here on the aisle. Uh, my name is Moin Yassin. I, I want to bring up two issues. At a time when Obama is in the Middle East um, waving peace to the Muslim world, you know, uh, mind you, at the same time you've got NATO on the, on the rampage in Afghanistan. Anyway, leaving that aside, uh, two things. One, British complicity, since we're in London. And secondly, Islamophobia. Now, firstly, I remember one great British Muslim historian, Dr. James Dickey, talking about the Anglo-Serbian alliance, uh, and he pinpointed Lord Carrington, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Bosnian Muslims' uh, denial or, or the push by various Western powers to deny the Bosnian Muslims uh, the right to, to, to defend themselves, the arms embargo. It was quite clear Carrington was in that conspiracy, factual conspiracy. <clears throat> I'd like your comment on that. Secondly, Islamophobia. You know, in this day and age, when we're talking about uh, Western moral leadership or the lack of it, you know, we, we, when, there, when there's a Muslim bad guy, no doubt there are quite a few of them. Uh, I'm not going to defend them. However, when we have Western bad guys, how do you explain that? Thank you very much. I'm not sure about the second well, well, question. Well, trying to, you know, these are uh, people like Mladic and Karadzic, unless you're naive, are war criminals uh, from a Muslim perspective, if not a human rights perspective. How come they have been protected to date, especially Mladic? And how, how does, that, does that not feed radical Islamic militancy in this country and abroad? Um, I don't know. Um, perhaps it does. Um, in terms of conspiracies, I mean, th this is a very sort of specific book and a, a very sort of specific issue. I, I don't want to get into into huge political discussions about whether there was Lord Carrington was in a, in a conspiracy or, or whatever. I don't know, and uh, can, can I, I wouldn't want to add. But just just point. one thing I, I would say though is is one of the, I think one of the reasons, one of the um, motivations that was going on 
in, in, in Ashdown's regime as high representative in, in Bosnia. One of the, the arguments to try and persuade more resources to be put into the, into the hunt for people like Karadzic was that uh, at a time when the West was being accused of being anti-Muslim, then politically it would look good or it could be useful to say that, listen, we're not uh, anti-Islam and we're prepared to put resources into finding people who happen to uh, be involved in, in the killing of thousands of Muslims. I think that was a, a sort of a political calculation at some point to try and persuade more resources to be devoted, whether in London or in Washington. Um, uh, I think that that was one, one element, but I, I wouldn't want to particularly go into uh, Lord Carrington's conspiracies. Or... Yeah, I don't think the, 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 I mean, I was there at the time that you're talking about, and the, the arms embargo was not, did not come about as a result of a conspiracy. It came about as a result of a decision of the Security Council of the United Nations taken, you know, on television. Uh, I don't think it was a conspiracy. It was a political decision. My own view at the time, and uh, I still have all this view, was that it was a, it was a mistake. But I don't, I, I've never thought it was a... Uh, it may have been illegal. I mean, uh, there, there's an argument that it was illegal. I think it was a political error. That's a Western perspective, with due respect. The Security Council does not represent the Muslim world. Okay. That's true. I mean, but but it, but but it, it, it's 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 still. I don't still. I still don't see how you can call it a conspiracy. I mean, it wasn't something that was cooked up or hatched in secret. It was done on television, and um, and so I always thought it was a mistake. And secondly, it's interesting to me that you should to focus on the long f the, the failure to catch Radovan Karadzic when the, the, on the two occasions when NATO, in effect NATO, has gone to war, it's been in defence of Muslim populations against uh, you know, an explicitly Christian nationalism. So I find it odd that you should concentrate on that. Um, I'll come back to you. We've got a question here. Yeah, I just wanted to, to ask Nick, um, obviously I've not had a chance to read the book yet because I'll, we'll get our copy after. Um, on your travels, obviously you've met a lot of people, you've talked to a lot of people from different groups, different ethnic groups, or parts of the old Yugoslavia. Um, how do you think Britain is perceived, but generally, in, in terms of what you saw? Is it in terms of, you know, obviously you read accounts, it's perceived as it is. What is the view, you know, because obviously there's been a lot of talk in the past about British complicity, those kinds of things, and some of the things that went on. What's your view on that? I think, it, I mean, every individual has their own views about Britain. Perhaps they've, uh, they've had, they have family here, or perhaps they were refugees here. Perhaps they have a more favourable view. Um, if you go and speak to Sonia Karadzic, then she's going to say that um, Britain was part of the uh, the anti-Serb alliance. Many people in Serbia have their big doubts about uh, about British policy, certainly. Um, but I think it's it's a fluid, uh, a fluid. Uh, Issue, and I think it depends on the individuals. It depends on on the people that you talk to. If you go to Kosovo, then uh, you're likely to get a free dinner or a, a free taxi ride because they regard Britain as, as the, the small brother of America, who ha helped create uh, uh, the independent Kosovo. If you talk to the, the Serb minority in Kosovo, obviously they have a, a slightly opposite view. So I think it just depends on on who you speak to and where you go. Mark, Mark Lyon there at the back. Hi there. I just want to go back to the EU question uh, briefly. It is, it's almost a year since he was caught, uh, and there still seems to be quite a lot of widespread opposition to Serbia's uh, membership or moving closer even towards the EU, notably from the Dutch government. Do you think that the Tadic government expected the impact of capturing Karadzic to be greater than it has been, uh, especially on softening the stance of countries like Holland? No, I, I don't think so. And I think there's always been a, a, a real awareness within uh, the circles around Tadic and within the, the Yaramich circles that uh, that it's going to take time. And, uh, you know, Karadzic is one person, but Ratko Mladic remains free. And the, the views are not going to change within the European Union uh, necessarily just because Karadzic has gone. Uh, but there's no doubt there is a real determination to get the country into the European Union. These days, the headlines in the Serbian media are not about Kosovo, they're not about war criminals. They're the same headlines as they are in this country about the economy and jobs and how everything is collapsing. And this is one of the, uh, the, the goals, one of the potential solutions to the everyday life that so many Serbs are going through. So I think they're determined to do it. Uh, they're aware that um, 
I think they're very aware that the European Union is quite often fickle and divided, um, and that's why perhaps many uh, Serbian negotiators have done well over the years. Uh, but there is a determination to get the country into the European Union, and they know that the, uh, the war criminal issue still remains a difficult one, and that's why there is a determination in some parts to get Mladic arrested and, and packed off to The Hague. Mark, can I just ask you, since you've still got the microphone, you've just come back from there, do you think, I mean, do you think that the pro-EU people who are now running Serbia feel insufficiently rewarded for what was, after all, quite a brave and difficult decision to hand carriage it over? I mean, I think that they're, they're, they clearly, there's clearly a huge desire to, 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 to move closer, and uh, I think that there is a, a, a a resentment to, to a certain extent that they're being that they're being cold shouldered for the moment, and um, you know clearly the, the the aim of the government is 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 EU accession, and I and I think that they, I, I mean I I'm interested really as, into whether, as to whether there is more apathy and there is there is there is perhaps you know the, the the more they're showing the cold shoulder, the more they're uh, you know the, the the further visa relaxation seems to be, the further away that seems to be. Uh, whether there is a sort of lack of enthusiasm, or whether there is perhaps a feeling amongst the government that actually, you know, capturing Mladic may may not be the final thing that gets them in, and you know, maybe actually, I mean, it, are, are, are there other, you know, does there need to be does there need to be more enthusiasm? Does there need to be more proactive attitude from Brussels to say yes, you know, once Mladic is caught, that will be. You know, a major, a major way, a major, a major milestone on the road. I mean, does that need to be? Does, does there need to be more of a carrot shown to the to, shown to the government? Do you think? I'm not sure. I think it's going to take years anyway before before Serbia's in the European Union. The Mladic issue is important, but as you're right, it's not the critical one, and there'll be plenty more bridges to cross before Serbia accedes to the EU, just like Kosovo. Yeah, there's a question behind Mark. Edina, isn't it? Hi, yeah. yes. Um, I just actually wanted to, to um, add to the point of, uh, that, that Mark made about the importance of the um, European Union and Serbia per perhaps joining um, sometimes in the future and the importance of uh, uh, Radko Mladic being captured. Um, certainly, that, that would be of a great significance for the region. And um, I think what perhaps uh, would be the, one of the, the key turning points for not only the Serbian government, but as well as, as Bosnia and the situation, the current situation down there, which is perhaps the biggest crisis since the, the, the conflict in the region, uh, especially uh, the, the um, as you as Alan Littlen earlier on mentioned, the, um, the pessimistic view of Joe Biden. Um, week ago uh, due to his visit in Bosnia. Um, it, the importance really is that the Serbian government and the Ser Serbian leadership um, should really acknowledge the, that genocide took place in Bosnia, uh, have all the war criminals arrested and brought to justice. Um, the effects of genocide need to be reversed in order for, for country to become more functional overall, uh, especially um, the, the Dayton Peace Accord, which has never actually been fully implemented, especially the Annex 7 of the uh, return of refugees, um, which has left the Republika Srpska uh, almost purely ethnically cleansed. Um, People have been allowed to reclaim their properties, though, haven't they? And not well. Uh, the, they, they could they could reclaim the properties. However, there is no real security and and the real uh, life perspectives in Republika Srpska. Um, even um, it, like there there haven't been expectations fulfilled by the, even Radovan Karadzic's expectations. He said we could tolerate uh, up to 10 percent of Bosniaks living in Republika Srpska. And if we look at the situation now, there are only about 8 percent of the Bosniaks who have returned because the Bosniaks uh, into the have been region. going back reclaiming their property and selling it to Serbs haven't they that's what's been happening uh, they've been that, selling their homes to Serbs yes some and of them be, to a because they, they absolutely still feel ter terrified in, in in living in that region because there are no job perspectives or, or uh, any sort of sense of uh, of uh, security especially that we hear the rhetoric uh, constant, constantly coming from the the, the uh, Serbian um, leaders like for example um, uh, uh, Dodik who um, has no interest whatsoever in seeing Bosnia joining the European Union, but um, the, the international community should really have a very um, strong um, uh, new policy and approach in, in that region, which, which they haven't had uh, up to date. So you share Joe, Joe Biden's pessimism that Bosnia is in fact coming Absolutely. apart? Absolutely. Especially at the moment, uh, Bosnia is actually entered a very um, critical uh, situation and, 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 and a time uh, of, of uh, very high political un uncertainty. Okay. 
I don't think we should necessarily overplay the war criminal issue anymore. I think it was it was a very potent issue very recently. But there is one bigger issue related to joining the European Union, and that's, that is Kosovo. Um, this has the potential to destabilize um, the progress that has been made. Serbia refuses to, to, to acknowledge Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo remains in a fragile state, um, very much divided along the Ibar River. Um, so the, the war criminal issue is important. It is an obstacle. But I think that the policy makers and politicians in Brussels are going to be looking that their, their lens is focused further out and it's focused on um, how on earth you can accommodate Kosovo and Serbia as two uh, separate states within the European Union and how you, you solve that one is going to be extremely difficult and, and solving it without any more violence which is always just bubbling under the surface. So the war criminal issue is important but I don't think it's the most important one now in terms of Serbia's accession. Uh, looked in, in, in comparison to Kosovo because Kosovo is a separate issue from, from the Bosnia and uh, by taking one country to the European okay. Union and, uh, we shouldn't um, compromise on another country and, and have uh, another conflict scene. Okay, great, thank you. Um, ambassador, you wanted to come back. Former Ambassador, can I, um, <laughs> can I just come back to the point about the sort of issue of the wider Islamic community and the radicalisation and so on, because I think it's an important one. My, I first came on the case in the Sarajevo Olympic Games in 1984, and I went down there as the Olympic attaché attached to the embassy. And I asked a question when they gave a big PR presentation of how wonderful Bosnia was about this group of political prisoners who'd just been rounded up, Muslim political prisoners. And this got a very frosty response, and one of them was Izzet Begovic. And I think it's very important to remember the role of Izzet Begovic in this, because he was a, a very complex character. Um, you know, these conspiracy theories or these sort of visions of the world. You talked about some of the, you know, the issues the Serbs have with Srebrenica. I was talking to one of the leading Bosnian, Bosniak slash capital M Muslim uh, journalists when I was ambassador there. And he said, well, of course, Bosnia is never going to be welcome in the EU. I said, why? No, we want to get you in the EU. He said, no, no, no. We know, you're, we know you'll never be welcome. I said, why? He said, because the symbol of the European Union, those little circle of yellow stars, and that's a Christian symbol of the halo on the Virgin Mary, chosen <laughs> deliberately to leave Muslims out. Now, this is very, very difficult to deal with. Um, when Mr. Derliacho, the war crime suspect, was shot by the SAS, this was a new Labour just come in, moral foreign policy. Remember, some of us remember those days. <laughs> Ethical foreign policy. Ethical, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> And possibly moral as well, who knows? But anyway, this was a big operation. It was a big moment. This was presented in the Sarajevo media as a pro-Serb plot by the British. He was a Serb killed by the British, and this was presented as a pro-Serb plot. Why? Because it would raise support for war criminals in Republika Srpska. This was just on the eve of Robin Cook's visit. Um, I, but I got to know President Izabegovic quite well, and I was thinking I was the only ambassador who he visited for tea just before I left. I invited him around for tea, and we were sitting there in the garden, and he said, he said something I've never forgotten, because it was so, you know, you have to remember he was a politician. He'd been along to the World Islamic Conference. It was never really reported, but he went along there and gave the World Islamic Community a lecture on moderation, saying we have to learn from the West about things like freedom of the press and women's rights and so on, a very brave speech. Um, so he was, he was coming from a very European tradition of Islam, very specific Bosnian one, but he said to me, I feel sorry for Milosevic. I said, well, that's interesting, you know, why? He said, because he's worried about his country being taken over by the Albanians. If you look at the demographics of this, this is very complicated. You know, we can't, as Bosnians, Muslims, accept ethnic disarmament because there's only two million of us. What would happen, you know, if we were, we've got no room for manoeuvre? So when you look at the question of the arms embargo, the arms embargo was all about transatlantic politics. And the, ar the mm. argument was, if we lift the arms embargo, the troops on the ground, the international troops, who may be related to people in this room, or may even be people in this room, would have to leave. Because if you lift the arms embargo, you're basically saying there's a, there's a free-for-all. You fi fight it out and see how you get on. And I asked Izzet Begovic about this. I said, you wanted the arms embargo lifted, but you wanted us to stay. You were never prepared to say, the international community should leave, we'll have the weapons and fight it out, because you knew you'd lose. And he agreed. And this is the whole point about the arms embargo. He didn't want to get wiped out. He had the interest of his community at heart, which was the right thing for him to do as a politician. And that's why the whole thing got in a mess. So the propaganda points about the arms embargo are missing certain political realities down there, which are very closely linked to the personalities. And I think that's worth you know, reminding ourselves of what it was like in those days. 
I can tell you there's a question at the front here. Yeah. And I'll take one more after that, and then we should probably. Nick is going to sign copies of his book in the corner there. It's a great book, to, by the way. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> very good. But you have to buy it. <laughs> yes. Reduced. Um, uh, just uh, checking, uh, in a sense, an, an impression I, um, I had. I was in Belgrade for a short time trying to interview people as a, a political scientist, rather. I mean, and seeing the, uh, talking to some people in the Serbian radical party, my impression was that their constituency uh, was, to a large extent, um, made up of uh, Serb refugees from other parts of former Yugoslavia. And from that point of view, there seemed to be some real basis to their grievance, if you like. And I, I just wondered whether, um, when I was, I was there in 2007, I just wondered uh, your sense at the moment if they've come any distance at all in, you know, in trying to maybe shape that sense of grievance into something that is more workable and. Well, they've created a new party yeah. <laughs> since then, so the, the, the former leader has set up his own, own party and split away from, from Shechel, who remains, remains in The Hague. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the radical... Well, I went to a few rallies and I interviewed Nikolic a few times. I think, I think you're right, there was, there was certainly a large constituency of people who were refugees from, uh, from different parts of Yugoslavia, but the radical party's main support came from the, the dispossessed um, urban workers, many of the people who've been made unemployed, unemployed, uh, who've suffered economically over, over the, the past few years, and they, they saw uh, the simple messages of, uh, of nationalism, um, of wiping out corruption. This was always the top, the top uh, uh, reference point for, for Nicholas to try and get rid of, rid of, rid of corruption. I think th this was the main, um, the main group of, of people who, who made up the party. I, I just remember, as I'm just speaking, I just remember going to uh, my first day reporting in Belgrade was the uh, the night that Shechel made his farewell speech in Republic Square and I crossed into into, into Serbia and drove along the, the highway and all these sort of uh, broken down blue vans and cars coming in from from rural areas with their flags waving out of the, of the windows and uh, and then going into the into the center of Republic Square and my BBC colleagues even uh, told me not to, to speak English uh, that it could be uh, pretty unpleasant and uh, and there, there was Shechel banging away saying you know, and I'm going. I'm volunteering myself. I will go to the Hague. But whatever happens, Miladic and Karadzic you must never give give them up. They must never go to the Hague. And then, and then there's perhaps four or five thousand people there. And then afterwards, they they went on a wander around the centre of Belgrade and. Uh, drank quite a lot of beer and, and smashed one or two windows, I seem to remember. Uh, uh, th those are the people, so, so urban dispossessed and, and rural uh, people, very much the constituency, I think, of, of the Radical Party. I can take one more question. Yes, Pranvera. Nick, you mentioned you were in Kosovo. I come from Kosovo. I was just wondering what do you think, what's Kosovo after 10 years now? What do you think is, is how is it doing? How's it doing? Politically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a big question. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Um, there always is in Kosovo, I suppose, about what's going to happen next. Um, but I'm actually working at the moment as a media advisor to the European Union, to the ULEX mission there. Um, so I, I'm seeing it from one angle rather than perhaps as a, as a journalistic uh, perspective, although it is quite interesting being sort of on the other side of the fence and seeing the decision-making process that, that takes place. Um, that, that's just a question of status, you know, you're never going to persuade the Serbs to accept an independent Kosovo, you'll never expe accept, uh, expect the, the Kosovo Albanians to, to, to accept anything else. Um, so there is deadlock and it is moving towards partition. Um, that has always been on the cards. Um, whether that will formally happen or not, I don't know. Um, there seems to be a lot of money in Kosovo, even though it's meant to be the, the poorest place or the second poorest place in Europe. Uh, lots of big cars, lots of uh, new houses being built, um, quite high rents. Um, so there is some sort of money going into Kosovo. I'm not quite sure where it's coming from. Um, and it always has the potential to uh, to break out into, into, into bigger violence. There was uh, this whole reconstruction taking place just close to, to North Mitrovica in the last few weeks. And the ULEX mission, the, the EU special police, were firing 
tear gas canister after tear gas canister after tear gas canister at the Serb protesters who were trying to break through and stop the reconstruction of these Albanian uh, Albanian homes. So, uh, you know, that caused quite a bit of uh, eyebrows raise and quite a lot of tension at the time, but it seems to have died down now. Uh, but I think it, it is always on, on the brink. And of course, the thing about Kosovo is it always has the potential to, to kickstart other conflicts, whether in southern Serbia or, or Macedonia, or even perhaps in, in, in Bosnia. So it's, um, it, it's, let's wait and see. Let's not, the world moves on, journalists go to other parts of the world, but Kosovo continues to bubble, and you never know quite what's around the next, next corner. The ULEX mission is the, is the largest EU civilian mission ever deployed, 2,000 internationals, 1,500 international policemen, uh, 1,000 locals working there trying to stabilise the environment. But uh, with elections coming up in the not-too-distant not future, we wait to see what happens. Prime Minister, I don't know if you know, last time I was in, in Sarajevo, a Bosnian friend of mine reminded me of a pre-war Yugoslav joke, uh, which goes like this. The Albanians would say, we're the least comfortable fit in multi-ethnic Yugoslavia, because at least every other national group are Slavs, and the national anthem starts, hey Slovenia, hey Slavs. So we're not even mentioned in the national anthem, to which the Serbian reply was, well, there's that line in the third verse that says, death to all traitors to the motherland, so you are mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Nick is going to sign copies of his book uh, over there. You're welcome to come and buy one, and he'll sign it for you. But please, and you're welcome to join us for a drink downstairs if uh, you want to continue the discourse, continue the conversation. Please thank Nick Horton.